Good morning. If y'all would, go ahead and turn to Nahum chapter 2. Nahum. It's, uh, go to the Psalms and take a few blocks to the right. Now keep in mind, if you're a believer, you're going to meet Nahum in heaven. And he's going to come up to you maybe and say, what do you think of my book? <laughs> and you're sinless when you get to heaven, so you've got to tell him the truth, right? So read it this week, perhaps. We're in chapter 2. It's going to be really an important focus will be on the Word of God. You see, God's going to keep His Word to you, believer, and He's going to save you to the uttermost. If you're an unbeliever today, you should note this. God will destroy you. God keeps His Word to the unbeliever, to the believer as well. Today, it's going out to the unbelievers. Let's take a look at what God is going to do to Nineveh, shall we? Chapter 2, the whole chapter. This is the Word of God. The one who scatters has come up against you. Man the fortress, watch the road, strengthen your back, summon all your strength. For the Lord will restore the splendor of Jacob like the splendor of Israel. Even though devastators have devastated them and destroyed their vine branches. The shields of his mighty men are colored red. The warriors are dressed in scarlet. The chariots are enveloped in flashing steel. When he is prepared to march and the cypress spears are brandished, the chariots race madly in the streets. They rush wildly in the squares. Their appearance is like torches. They dash to and fro like lightning flashes. He remembers his nobles. They stumble in their march. They hurry to her wall and the mantelet is set up. The gates of the rivers are opened and the palace is dissolved and it is fixed. She is stripped. She's carried away. And her handmaids are moaning like the sound of doves beating on their breasts. Though though Nineveh was like a pool of water throughout her days, now they are fleeting. Stop, stop, but no one turns back. Plunder the silver, plunder the gold, for there is no limit to the treasure. Wealth from every kind of desirable object. She is emptied. Yes, she is desolate and waste. Hearts are melting, knees are knocking. Also anguish is in the whole body, and all their faces are grown pale. Where is the den of the lions, and the feeding place of the young lions, where the lion, lioness, and lion's club prowled, with nothing, nothing to disturb them? The lion tore enough for his cubs, killed enough for his lioness, and filled his lairs with prey, and his dens with torn flesh. Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts. I will burn up her chariots and smoke. A sword will devour your young lions. I will cut off every prey from the land, and no longer will the voice of your messengers be heard. May the Lord add to His blessing the reading of His Word and our time together. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we give you thanks that you are not... I wanted more. How about y'all? That was good. I don't want to be up here. All right. Folks, we are in Nahum today. If you are new here to the chapel, I'm not normally the guy that's preaching, so if you don't like it, good. Dan will be back next week. Um, You know, there's an ancient book, and it's not the true religion of Christ, but it comes up with a book for us. And I wouldn't suggest you reading necessarily. It's called the Koran. I'm not going to be teaching from it today so you can breathe a sigh of relief. But it's interesting the thing about the book is they call uh, Christians people of the book. They actually called the Jews that as well. But primarily Christians were known as people of the book. Uh, later on, uh, when the gospel was first take, taken to Africa, Asia... In the New World, missionaries translated God's Word into uh, the vernacular of the people there. And from that point on, they continued to call Christians people of the book. I mean, keep in mind, a lot of those cultures, that was the first book they ever had, was the Bible. First book ever written uh, in their culture because they had no written language. But missionaries would come in and and translate the Bible. Because what they wanted them to know, first off, more than anything else, is you need to know that God has spoken. And it's in a book. And too many times, though, Christians have, we've been known as people of the book, but if I were to to go down the row and say, 
How many of y'all have heard of that term before? Um, some of you are just not familiar with it. As a matter of fact, if I were to say people of the book, you might go, maybe that's a Muslim because you burn the Koran, they're going to kill you. No, Christians are people of the book. But sadly, too many times we don't practice it, right? And yet the Bible is very clear about the importance that he puts upon his book. Psalm 138, verse 2, it says that God has exalted above all things. Take a look at everything. What does He exalt? He exalts His name and His Word. You know, I say His Word, not just the spoken Word of God, but the written Word of God that each of us contain in our hands today. You know, this book is fascinating. This book, it shows God keeping His Word to Nineveh. Because what we're going to see is in this section here is that the book of Nahum is Nineveh part two, the revenge. Part one was Jonah. And that we've been going through in our Peculiar People class uh, where God had mercy on the Ninevites and He granted them salvation and they believed by and large. 150 years later, uh, their grandkids, in some ways you could say, repented of their repentance. And they're just as vile and violent and wicked as ever. And so God is going to prophesy He's going to destroy them. You see, this book that we have before us is fascinating because it prophesies and it predicts and it's all true. Not only that, think about the other things the Bible does for you. God, uh, God's Word, it uses the hearing and reading of His Word to justify us through the Spirit, right? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of truth. It, it's used to sanctify us, to give us comfort, to show us God's will, and maybe perhaps most importantly to reveal the Messiah, Jesus Christ to us, Right? It's amazing. I'll just, by way of introduction, I'll give you seven things that the Bible, that God's Word also does. And I have to give you seven because we're in church. But there's more, but I'll just give you seven. Number one, God's Word created all things. Genesis 1-3, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Number two, God's Word sustains all of life. Hebrews 1-3, it says, Christ upholds the universe by the Word of His power. Number three, God's Word causes God's sheep to follow Him, right? John 10, 27, Jesus says, My sheep hear My voice, and I know them, and they follow Me. Now, I didn't hear audibly the voice of Jesus when I became a believer, but when people gave me the Gospel, I don't remember exactly how it happened, but I remembered I went from could care less about the Bible and God's people and God to all of a sudden, hey, I want to follow this guy. I want to follow this shepherd. What happened? I heard his voice. God regenerated me, gave me faith and repentance. I believed. Uh, number four, God's word preserves the heavens and the earth for the day of judgment. 2 Peter 3, 7, by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. God's word. Number five, God's word will raise his elect at his return. 1 Thessalonians 4.16, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, and with the voice of an archangel, and the, voice, and the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will raise first. This is kind of freaky. Number six, God's Word will resurrect the human dead of all time. Think about this. Unbelievers one day will hear His voice. In essence, it says in Matthew, rather John 5, 28 and 29, do not marvel at this for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. And finally, number seven, God's word will assign eternal destinies. Matthew 25, 41 and 46, then he will say, to those who are on this left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And these will go away into eternal life, but the righteous, rather, these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So the question to begin today is this. Are y'all people of the book? Are you people of the book? And what I mean by that, not simply do you memorize the Scripture, do you have devotional lives in the Scripture, do you come here on Sunday, but is the Word changing you? Is it washing you? Because this is what the Spirit uses 
to change you to become more like the Son. Are you people of the book? I'll give you an example real quickly as we are about to begin the text. 17th century. The story always kind of chokes me up, so you'll have to bear with me. Richard Cameron, a Presbyterian leader in Scotland, fought against the Scottish kings who were trying to force the church to submit to its authority. Hundreds or perhaps thousands of believers were killed for their faith. Cameron himself was tracked down by the authorities and killed in 1680. His hands and feet were severed from his body and taken to Edinburgh, where they were shown to his father, Alan, who himself was imprisoned for his faith. Yet when his father was shown his son's head and hands, and then the soldiers mockingly asked, Do you know them? Alan Cameron did something unexpected. He reached down and he kissed his son's head and said, I know them. I know them. They are my sons. My own dear sons, it is the Lord. Good is the will of the Lord who cannot wrong me or mine, but has made goodness and mercy to follow me all the days of my life. You see, he was a person of the book. And he would, clung, he would cling to Romans 8.28. God cannot wrong me. He can't. Why? Because he says he won't. He says that all things will work together for my good, even as I kiss my dead son decapitated head. And not only that, but he also can quote Psalm 23, surely goodness and mercy follows me all the days of my life. Can't, you can hurt me, as Justin Martyr said, but you cannot kill me. We will live forever. Chapter 2 of Nahum, verse 1. This is the will of the Lord. Let's take a look. The one who scatters has come up against you, God says. And literally what he says, the one who scatters is against your face. He's in your face. He's talking about the Ninevites. And by the way, before I go any further, you should note this. Assyrians are Ninevites. Ninevites are Assyrians. Nineveh is the capital of Assyria if you will, and Nineveh is being destroyed. And so who is the scatterer? Well, it's one of three. Uh, the scatterer could be the Medes, uh, the Medes who were led by Syaxares, uh, or it may have been the Babylonians who were led by Nabopolassar. You know that guy, or at least you know his son named Nebuchadnezzar, right? So these two men were leading two different armies that joined together called the Medo-Babylonian army to destroy the Ninevites. It could have been one of those two, but really I think it's the third one. I think the scatterer is the Lord, and the Lord is saying, I am scattering you. And note this, Nineveh is not yet scattered, but in verse 1 it predicts future events as if they have already occurred in the past. You see, that's what God can do. In Hebrew and Greek it's called the, the prophetic perfect. You know it, because what it means for you is this, Romans 8.30. Those whom he predestined, these he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're a believer today, you've been glorified. And you go, I've not been glorified. Yes, it's such a done deal in the mind of God. You have been, although not necessarily in time yet. That's the prophetic perfect. That's why we can say in Ephesians 2.6 that you have been, past tense, seated with Christ in the heavenly places. People of the book know that. People of the book live by that. Notice what he does in the verse uh, 1. He says this, The one who has scattered upon you has come up against you. Man the fortress. Watch the road. Strengthen your back. Summon all your strength. Uh, first off, this phrase, strengthen your back, it literally, what he says is make strong your loins. And what that would refer to is tucking in the ends of your long outer cloak Stick it in your belt so that you can run. God here is mocking the Assyrians, the Ninevites. And he's saying, brace yourselves. Watch the road. Strengthen your back. Summon all your strength. And so what he's doing, he's taunting them. God's going to destroy them. He knows exactly what he's going to do. He's taunting them. As a matter of fact, you're familiar with taunting. If you've been to enough sports events or perhaps you played high school ball, um, you may not know of the band Steam, some of you may, that wrote a little song in 1969, but you know the song. 
You've heard it. It made you angry. Or maybe you sang it in the stands. And it goes something like this. Na, 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 na. Na, 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 na. Join me. Hey, hey, hey. Goodbye. I hate that song. <laughs> Why? Because I was on the losing end most of the time. The, that song has caused more fights at ball games than any other song that I know of. This is exactly what the Lord is doing here. I'm taunting you. I'm going to destroy you for what you've done to my people. Right? What we're going to see here in verse 2 and following is the Lord is going to line out exactly what He's going to do. It's going to be, it's going to be perfect and it's going to be in His own timing. Take a look. Verse 2. For the Lord will restore the splendor of Jacob like the splendor of Israel, even though devastations have devastated them and destroyed their vine branches. Once again, prophetic perfect here. God is destroying Nineveh, and note this, as He destroys Nineveh, He is in fact restoring His people. He's restoring them. Now, ultimately, it's interesting because He doesn't ultimately restore Israel as much as He restores Judah. You know the story. The northern kingdom was destroyed by the Assyrians. Y'all, by and large, the Israelites never came back. They got assimilated. Some of them did. But when Judah and Benjamin were taken over by the Babylonians, they came back because God brought them back home. So I think ultimately there's a kind of a two-part, uh, a two-fold prophecy here. Part of it is God did restore His people, but I think one day He will restore them at the time of the thousand-year reign of Christ. So verse 3, it continues on. And before I tell you any further, I had a friend of mine who used to do, he was involved in like a uh, Civil War reenactment. You've seen this before. Whenever people do Civil War reenactments, it's interesting, but you already know who the winner is, right? And so he does Gettysburg every time, and he's, he fights for the South. I'm like, did you ever get weary of this? You lose every time. Uh, this is kind of the picture here. God is going to give a reenactment. It hasn't happened yet, but he's prophesying, and all of it will come exactly true the way he says. So it just... Use some holy imagination as we cover this text. I think it's interesting. Verse 3, The shields of his mighty men are colored red. The warriors are dressed in scarlet. Now he's referring to the Medo-Babylonian army here at this point. Why are they dyed red? Why would they color themselves in red and their shield in red? Well, Calvin has something to say about it. I think he's right. The ancients dyed their bull's high shields red, partly to strike terror into the enemy. And yet also, lest the, lest the blood from their own wounds, which they might receive, should be perceived and give confidence to the foe. So part of the reason they covered everything in red is because they thought, well, I might get cut up pretty bad too, and so I'll just kind of blend in with the color. Secondly, the Medes and the Babylonians, according to history, that was their favorite color. So they're all dressed in red, and it's pretty scary if you're a Ninevite this day. Notice what's happening. Verse 3, uh, the chariots are enveloped in flashing steel when he is prepared to march, and the cypress spears are brandished. The word chariot here, it actually comes from the Latin word charis, or charis, and uh, it, means, it means to run. And you know what's fascinating? I think, I, I'm, not, I'm not a strong person in the language. I'm always working on it, but um, I think you should know it. But a chariot of war was called, you know what it was called? It's called a car. Isn't that interesting? You start, it helps you start understand the road rage that we can have in Dallas from time to time. It's the word car. And literally, that's what they would take into battle. They would take their cars into battle. And the chariots, they had these sort of flashing metal fittings that would fit on the axles. And the, they, they were a iron sith that they would kind of turn at right angles. and look scary. If you've seen Ben-Hur, you may know what I speak of. Um, then they're brandishing their spears. Well, I don't use that term brandish that often, but what it means literally is to wave about in a menacing way. So you get the idea. These chariots are out. They're, they're brandishing these uh, spears like this one's about to go in you here. And that's what's happening. Verse 4, the chariots race madly in the streets. They rush wildly in the squares. Their appearance is like torches. They dart to and fro like lightning flashes. Keep in mind, these Medo-Babylonians, they're, to, to, they're ready to kill the Assyrians, the Ninevites, for all the horrible things the Ninevites have done throughout the centuries to their own people. 
They're getting their revenge. And if you're a Ninevite, you're scared to death. Verse 5, he, and I think this is referring to the leader of the Medo-Babylonian army, he remembers his nobles or his officers, and they stumble in their march. They hurry to her wall, and the mantelet is set up. Here we have the attacking army. The attacking army here, and they're setting up a mantelet. When was the last time you used that term in a sentence? Probably never. Mantelet is, don't think battering ram. Mantelet is something very different. It's, it's a movable protective shelter used to protect the invading soldiers, all right? If you, before you set up a mantelet, you'd bring the soldiers forward with these huge shields, and they would put it up like this and try to protect themselves. But eventually you can uh, work in a movable, uh, it's called a mantelet. And it's a, uh, like I said, it's a shelter that, that would protect the soldiers as they're busy trying to destroy your wall. They're setting up these embankments that will eventually allow you to bring a battering ram to destroy it. And they're coming after you, Nineveh. That's the point. They're coming after you. You cannot escape. Verse 6, the gates of the rivers are open and the palace is dissolved. And at this point, you may scratch your head and say, I don't, I don't understand that. Well, you know, archaeology proves this, and the Bible predicts this, that Nineveh was actually not destroyed so much by an army as much as it was destroyed by a flood, a flood of water. You see, the floodgates controlled the flow of the Koser River that would, go, that would flow right through Nineveh. And the leaders of the Medo-Babylonian army got together and said, let's flood this place. And what they did is they diverted the water from the Kosar River and they made reservoirs a couple of miles outside of the city gates. Now, if you're a Ninevite and you're like dealing with this siege, what are you noticing as you look at the river? It's going down. Every day it's going further down. What's going on? Well, they're cutting off your water supply, but they're also going to use this water to one day flood the city. An interesting thing, God in his own providence, you know what he sent right before they flooded the city? Rain shower after rain shower. You see, God wasn't going to destroy this city. And it wasn't just going to be the minds of men that come up with this. He's going to do it himself. As a matter of fact, there's historical documents on this. A Greek historian named Seleucus writes that there was an old prophecy that Nineveh should not be taken until the river become its enemy. So in the third year of the siege, the river by a flood broke down the walls. They eventually let the, the, the dams rise up, so they flowed quickly from these reservoirs and just flooded the city. As a matter of fact, it flooded the city gate for two and a half miles, just destroyed the walls there. Well, what did the king of Nineveh do? Well, he took the brave route, but not really. He took all of his concubines and all of his riches and lit the palace on fire and uh, just destroyed his own city. He's wicked. So I'm going to take a break here and just say one thing. When God says he's going to destroy unbelievers, he's going to do it. Uh, much in the same way when he says he will save the elect, he will do it. Okay? So for you to somehow think, well, maybe I'm an exception to the rule if you're an unbeliever today. Flee to the cross today. You're going to die in your sins. And God is going to send you to hell. Why? Because the Son paid the price for God's wrath upon the world. He paid the price. You wouldn't have Him. So what is your job? Your job will be to pay for your sins for eternity, which you will never be able to fully pay. Come to Him today. Verse 7. It is fixed. She is stripped, she's carried away, and her handmaids are moaning like the sound of doves beating on their breasts. What does she is stripped mean? Well, it could mean one of two things. It may describe how they would strip the entire city of all of its riches. Or sadly, it may be the uncovering of a person's clothing, which invariably would happen in times of war. And the handmaidens are weeping. They're mourning like doves. You hear the doves in the morning. They have these mourning doves. It sounds like somebody's crying, and that's the picture you have here. They're weeping. The Ninevites are being destroyed. Verse 8, though Nineveh was like a pool of water throughout her days, now they are fleeing. Stop, stop, but no one turns back. 
You know, Nineveh was famous for its artificial pools. They had these beautiful pools in the royal gardens. And now they're gone. As the Medo-Babylonian army floods the city, not just with water, but with their own people. And the Ninevites, they can't get that. They're, they're fleeing the city. They're taking off. And no one can stop them because they're running for their lives. Verse 9, plunder the silver, plunder the gold, for there is no limit to the treasure. Wealth from every kind of desirable object. I don't think we fully grasp this. How much money Nineveh had. I mean, keep in mind what they had done for hundreds of years. They stole riches from the nations they destroyed. So they had overflowing river of riches. Secondly, they also took from countries like Israel and Judah. Remember, they stripped the temple bare. They made them vassal countries. Of course, the king of Judah should have never done that. The kings, rather, of Judah should have never done that. But y'all, that's the price that had to be paid for Nineveh not to destroy you. It'd be like the bully that takes your lunch money. You got to give it to him or he's going to beat you up. And that's this picture here, all these vassal countries. And finally, Nineveh was known as a trading post. They were filthy, Filthy, rich. So Lucas, the Greek historian, writes about it, that there was so much money that the enemy didn't even pursue the fleeing Ninevite army. Ninevite army took off and they didn't even go after them. Archaeologists came to the Ninevite ruins in the 19th century A.D. That means Nineveh was so flooded, they didn't even find the city until the 19th century. They were surprised to see that the only valuable metals were small articles made of bronze with maybe gold fittings and perhaps a few alabaster vases. They stripped that city bare. They plundered it. I want to ask you something. Are we like the Medo-Babylonians, plundering all that we can? And they plundered the city. They took it all. You know, the Bible actually tells us, in essence, to do the same thing. Not with earthly riches, right? With heavenly riches. Matthew 6, 19 through 21 tells us, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on our earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Ladies and gentlemen, are you plundering today? I mean, th think about this, if you will. Uh, Christ makes this very clear. He says, it, ple it has pleased the Father to give you the kingdom. It's yours. If you're in Christ, you have the kingdom. Now, plunder. What do I mean by that? Well, let me give you a couple of examples, right? What is the great commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second is like it. Love your neighbors yourself. Are you practicing that? Are you practicing the one another's of Scripture? There's about 30 or 40 of them in the New Testament. Love one another, encourage one another, build one another up, serve one another. There's sometimes you spur one another on towards love and good deeds. That's just a few of them. And how about this? Are you making disciples, right? I've joked about this before, but there's reasons why that we don't just hold you under when you get baptized, right? We get you back up. So you can go and make disciples. This is our job. I fail at this all the time. I felt so convicted going through this that I, that I did get an opportunity to witness to a guy the other day. I'll just tell you about it, just maybe to encourage you. But I thought, I, thought, I need to plunder for the kingdom. God has given it to us. We just need to go. And so I was uh, at the doctor, uh, doctor's appointment the other day, and one of the uh, medical staff, I was talking to them, and I said, uh, hey, you go to church anywhere? And by the way, whenever you ask people, where do you go to church? You should know this. It's a great, exam it's a great opportunity for the gospel to come forth. Because if they say yes, what do you do next? Hey, you know, I'm wondering, what does your church teach about how a person is right with God? Or maybe, and then they might go, huh? And then you go, well, like, how do you know when, when you die that you would, you would go to heaven? I mean, we're all sinners. We all do stuff we shouldn't. And you can go straight into the gospel there. Or if they say, well, I, I don't go to church anywhere. Well, then go with the next question. Really? Well, I mean, we all die someday. I mean, if, God, if you were to stand before God one day at death and you were to say, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? It just go straight. 
Follow just the, just the direction of it. So I, by God's grace, I was able to talk with him. But before I sought to give him the gospel, I thought, I've seen enough that I think it's important. All Americans think they're going to go to heaven. Do you know this? Uh, it's important to try to get a person lost beforehand. And um, in order to be able to give him good news, you give him bad news. So I really appreciate Ray Comfort. has been very helpful in this by showing me that, hey, you use the law to show people uh, right, that, that they're not righteous. And so I said, hey, let me ask you this. Would you consider yourself a good person? You know what his answer was? Yes. Can you believe that? Of course you can believe that. He said, well, yeah, I, I think I am. I said, can I challenge you on it? And I said it with a smile because I don't want him to, you know, <laughs> walk away. And yeah, sure. So I said, how about this? Well, I mean, have you told any lies in the last year? And he goes, well, yeah, I mean, I have. And uh, I said, okay, well, I mean, I have too. What do you call somebody who lies? And that's typically they won't say until I say, what would you call me if I lie? And they say, a liar. I don't have any problem with that. And so I said, well, how about this one? Um, Jesus says, you know, if you look at a woman with lust, you commit adultery with her in your heart. I mean, I know I've, I've done that. Have you done that? And he said, I mean, yeah, I, ha I have done that. I said, okay, well, one more is, um, you know, have you ever stolen anything, even something small? And he said, no, no, I've, I've never stolen anything, uh, nothing. And I, and I was about to go on, and he said, hold on a second. You already know I lie. So, <laughs> actually, I did. I, I used to steal when I was a kid. And the amazing thing about this, y'all, is that he had just told me that he just finished up medical school, and he was wondering what he should do with his life. As I soon started to give the gospel, and at that point, I said, listen, by your very words, you're a lying, thieving, adulterer at heart. And do you think you'd be innocent or guilty in God's presence? And he said, I mean, I'd be guilty. And I said, well, let's, let me tell you what. I've got the best news in the world for you today. And I was able to give him the gospel that, hey, you're a sinner. You're, the payment, one day God's going to pay you for those sins. And you're going to die and go to hell for eternity. And you have no hope of any good works because your good works are like filthy rags. But God demonstrates his own love towards you. Now, while you were still guilty and still a sinner, he sent his son to come die for you. And I told him, I said, one day Christ is going to come back. This body is going to be brand new. He's going to make all things new. But until that time, I know when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. If God were to say, and I don't think he will, but if he were to say, Jeff Brown, why should I let you into heaven? I would say, you shouldn't. I am a sinner. And yet there's a man sitting right next to you, Jesus Christ, who died and rose for me. He gave me his righteousness. I gave him my sin. So he didn't become a believer, but I told him to think about it. And I tell you all that because, y'all, we need to plunder. God got you out of your baptismal to go out and go. All right? By the way, I'm not going to give you the bad example from a week ago where I totally chickened out. Didn't say anything. It's okay. You get back up the plate and swing because you know it's the Spirit doing in you, through you, and catch this, in spite of you, right? All right, I digress. Where are we? Verse 10. Verse 10, she is empty. She is desolate, waste. Hearts are melting and knees are knocking. Also anguishes in the whole body. All their faces are grown pale. Ninevites are scared to death. As a matter of fact, when it says they are grown pale, it's the Hebrew word withdraw. You could probably figure that out, right? The blood is withdrawn from their face. They're white as a sheet. They're about to die. They're about to meet their maker, and they're not ready for it. Verse 11 and 12. Where is the den of lions and the feeding place of the young lions, where the lion, lioness, and lion's cub prowled with nothing to disturb and filled his lairs with prey and his dens with torn flesh? You might be thinking, what does this mean? Well, Nineveh, the Assyrians... Lions, that was their symbol. In particular, lions with wings, right? They knew that lions were the king of the jungle. That's an ancient idea. And so that was their, that was their symbol of the country. As a matter of fact, if you go today to the British Museum, you'll see these huge Assyrian statues, lions with wings. Some of y'all have been in New York City. It's there too. They've got them everywhere, even around the globe today, because the Assyrians, the Ninevites, kept making more and more of these. As a matter of fact, one of their leaders named Sennacherib would describe himself. He said, like a lion, I raged against the enemy. 
Do you know what the capital of Assyria at Nineveh was called? The lion's den. Y'all, God knows all this. God's word is true. And he's writing out saying, hey, where's your den of lions? Not looking so good these days, right? And then he'll describe what all these lions did and they tore people and they destroyed them. And yet God is saying, where is your lion, right? You know, something to note, especially being Americans, is the term superpower. Uh, I'll give you a working definition of it. It's a state with a dominant position in the international system which has the ability to influence events and its own interests and project power on a worldwide scale to protect those interests. Assyria was the superpower of the age. One of the historians has written, there have been 17 superpowers in the history of the world. They have all thought of themselves as exceptional. Hmm. Sounds strangely familiar. I don't know what our future holds. And I don't think it's, it's not our job as believers to win America. It's our job to make disciples from whatever tribe, tongue, people, and nation they may be from. But we as Americans, God put you here in Dallas to make disciples. Okay, so yes, vote well. Pray for your leaders. Be wise. But ultimately, and I'm going to get pushed back. I'm going to say it anyway. God doesn't predict the saving of America. He doesn't predict the United States of America will be right there at the end. No, what he says that every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, the elect from before the foundation of the world will be worshiping the Son. Okay? Beware. The Lord may look down upon America, and he may be doing it even now and saying, where's your bald eagle now? Where's your bald eagle? Don't you know I'm the only strength in the world? And I raised you up, and I will take you down in my own timing. Finally, verse 13. Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts. I will burn up her chariots in smoke. A sword will devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the land. And no longer will the voice of your messengers be heard. Let me give you one line from Hebrews 10.31 that describes what we're talking about today. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And here we have, we have the Lord of hosts. We sing it, right? Uh, Lord Sabaoth, His name from age to age the same. And as you sing it, you're always going, is it Sabaoth? Is it Sabaoth? Is it Sabaoth? That's it. It means Lord of hosts. And you might scratch your head and go, what does Lord of hosts mean? It means Lord of armies. Lord of armies. You see, you thought, Nineveh, that the Bab Babylonians and the Medes were destroying you. I'm destroying you. And the only reason why God is destroying him, well, ultimately, is because God says, I'm going to destroy you. Y'all, God's word is amazing, right? Too many times we're underwhelmed by his word instead of overwhelmed by it. You should note this. No one would have guessed that Nineveh would fall. No one. No one in the ancient world would have thought Nineveh would fall. And yet when God, God's Word declares it to be so, it's going to happen. Question I began with, question I will end with. Are you people of the book? Are you really people of the book? Because according to Psalm 138, verse 2, that's what God puts above all things, His name and His Word. Isaiah 40, verse 8, puts it this way, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Are y'all people of the book? Am I a person of the book? I like what A.W. Tozer says. It. He says, Christians don't tell lies. They just go to church and sing them. On a personal note, I just got word this past week that I once again have a strange and fairly rare skin disorder called pityriasis rubra polaris. It's not excruciating, but it is painful some days more than others. It's not contagious. <laughs> but if you were to come up afterwards, I would probably fist bump you because you don't want to feel it and it kind of hurts to squeeze hands. Um, by the way, it should go away sometime. I've had it one other time. It took about nine months to go away, but 
it typically subsides after weeks or months. But please pray for me. I would appreciate that. But I will tell you this. The reason why I mention it is because in this past week or so, God's Word has just flooded me, much in the same way that it's flooded Nineveh. and has nothing to do with me. God in His grace has just brought it upon me. You see, so many believers, we, uh, we read great devotions, great devotionals. We read theologians. We don't read His Word. It's the only book written by God. And the, the verses that have been coming to mind for me have been Romans 8.18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present age are not worth the glory that will be revealed to us. Right? Philippians 3.1 Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me, and it's safe for you. It's safe for you to rejoice in the Lord. Hebrews 12 The Lord does what? Disciplines those whom He loves. And I love what it says later on. It says, God is treating you as sons. So when you go through troubles and trials and heartaches, you're like, why? And God looks down and He's going, I'm treating you as my kid. You're mine. I'm going to give you this to make you more like my son. Philippians 3, also 10, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things including skin problems, to himself in his own time, in his own way. Y'all, I'm weary of this, and I hope you are too. People that will say, you know, the Bible says this, but I think that is damnable. This is the Word of God. Don't argue with it. Get underneath it. Give you an example of a lady who did that in conclusion. It's a story, it's a story from Eric Alexander, a story from church history that really encapsulates the importance believers of the past put upon the Word of God. Because ultimately, if the Lord said it, it's true, right? We serve a God, catch this, who cannot lie. It's impossible for Him to lie by His own words. So we can take comfort that He will save us and He will destroy Unbelievers. So come to him today if you don't know him. Here's the words. Alexander says, There was once a Scottish minister named Halliburton who lived in the lowlands of Scotland. He went into the home of an elderly lady and knew she was dying. She had been dying for some time, but the medical practitioner told him it wasn't long now. She would die soon. He went in and said to her, Annie, my dear, how are you? And she said, Not Very well, minister. He said to her, Now, how do you know that when you die, you're going to be in a far better country and with such company as the Lord Jesus Christ? And they talked about this for a while, speaking of her salvation. And she even managed to smile. But then he mysteriously said to her, Annie, what would happen if God let you go at the last? The people in the room looked at each other. She drew a breath, and she seemed to wake up slightly, and then she said, You know that can never be, minister. And he said to her, Why? Ah, well, he would lose far more than I would lose if he cast me off. And he said, Explain to me. And she said, Well, I would lose my soul, but he would lose his honor. And he said, God bless you, my dear. We will meet in glory, and I by the honor of his name. And she went to sleep in Jesus. You see, if you are one of Jesus' sheep, you have the same glorious assurance. He will never let you go. He will never let you perish. Why? Because his honor is in his name and in his word. Let's pray. Father, we confess today that we do not love your word. At least me, I'm speaking for them. We don't love it the way we should. We don't abide by it the way we should. We are not people of the book the way we should be people of the book. And so we pray that you would just grant us that we would have a heart for that and a hunger for it. 
And that you would use your word to keep us from sin. But more importantly, you would use your word to shape us to become more like the Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to be those sort of people that we would long to be a lighthouse, not only for Dallas itself, but for the people of the world. That you would bring them to the Savior by people reading our lives. If they won't read your book, maybe they will read us. Help us to be so saturated with your word that we would bleed the Bible. Your holy word. In your son's name we pray it. Amen.